Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Laura Fortman. I'm the Commissioner of Labor. I'm joined today, as usual, by my colleague. Hi, I'm Kim Smith. I'm the Deputy Commissioner. And we want to thank you for uh, joining us this afternoon for our weekly briefing on unemployment insurance. I do want to say up front that there was a problem logging into the Facebook Live um, portion of this, but we will be recording uh, today's presentation and posting it on Facebook later this afternoon. Uh, we thought it was better to go ahead and uh, have the briefing with the legislators who have set aside time uh, to meet with us this afternoon um, and that that was our priority. And we apologize to anyone who was unable to join this through the Facebook um, channel. So <clears throat> I just wanted to give you a quick overview of what we would be covering today. Um, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about the uh, president's executive order, talk about the work share program, talk about work search, and then give an update um, as well on all of the um, progress that we're making around um, the actual benefit payment portion of uh, the work that we do. Uh, we did not receive any questions this week that fall outside of those categories. So I'm hoping that we will um, be able to answer any questions that you have or that um, people uh, who will be uh, looking at this later on might have about any of those, those issues. But as always, please feel free to put questions in the chat or um, once we get through the, the slides to uh, unmute yourselves and, and we can um, uh, answer questions that way as well. So if we can put the slides up and just dive into it. And probably the question that we've received um, the most in the past week um, has been around the President's Executive Order. As everyone in this meeting knows, the um, Federal Pandemic Unemployment Assistance uh, compensation program rather ended with the week ending July 25th. That was the additional $600 that went to anyone who was receiving at least $1 in either state unemployment or in any of the federal programs. Since then, uh, people have been very anxious about would there be some sort of an additional supplemental unemployment insurance benefit to folks. Um, we were looking to Congress uh, to see what we, they would do, and uh, no congressional action, no agreed upon congressional action has happened. Uh, but last Saturday, the president signed an executive order regarding the lost wage assistance program. I want to be really clear that this is a program that is coming out of the Federal Emergency Management Agency from a, a finite pool of disaster relief funding. This is not an unemployment insurance program, but it would be uh, resources that would go toward people who are receiving unemployment benefits. As uh, proposed, the program would provide $300 in federal funds that require a $100 match from the state. All federal emergency uh, management money, all FEMA money, must have a 25% match. For the $300, it's our understanding that states could count their regular um, unemployment benefit toward that uh, match to draw down the $300. The reason we would be able to do that is because the uh, state unemployment insurance is paid for by employer taxes and not any sort of federal funds. So that would be the $300. Uh, to get to access the $400 that I think a lot of people had heard about, the state would, in addition to the $100 match from the state unemployment insurance, the state would also have to come up with another $100 roughly, uh, and that would need to come uh, from a different source. It could be a uh, general fund, uh, but it could not be unemployment insurance money because 
The administrative funding for unemployment insurance is all federal funds, and we're already using the unemployment insurance uh, benefit as the match for the, we would already be using that for the match of the $300. We estimate that it would be an additional $8 million a week uh, to draw down that additional uh, $100. Now, um, the proposal was put out there and signed by the president last Saturday. Since then, we have been working with USDOL, uh, with our new colleagues at FEMA, to try to um, understand how this program could work, and we will continue to uh, gather information and, um, and um, program requirements to make sure that we fully understand this program. Uh, the other thing I do want to say is that the disaster assistance is a finite pool of funding. Um, you know, we've heard that it's roughly $44 billion uh, for all uh, states, uh, and that there is a deadline of applying for this money of September 10th. So we do have a little bit of time. Um, but there are lots and lots of questions. Kim, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. I don't have anything to add to that particular piece, so we can move to the next slide. Okay. So this is just a quick uh, top-line summary of the um, activities that we've been engaged in since last week. Um, the top-line numbers are that roughly 151,000 people have applied for unemployment benefits since March 15th, and um, there's a slight decrease in the number that we're counting there because, as you all know, we have been diligently working on identifying and removing fraudulent claims, and that's the decrease that you see here. We've uh, pulled out the uh, claims that we've determined to be fraudulent, and we won't be including those in our counts moving forward. Um, roughly 98% of anyone who has filed an initial claim has either received a benefit um, or uh, they have uh, filed an initial certification but have not completed a weekly certification or they were determined to not be eligible. Uh, so um, about 88% of people have received a benefit and that comes to about 132, almost 133,000 people uh, have received at least one benefit. So that means that the other 2% uh, are, are people who we are um, working toward resolving their cases in a couple of different ways. One is uh, addressing fact-finding, and we've talked about this over the past couple of weeks. We have a small group of adjudicators who are focused exclusively on uh, accelerating the process of um, resolving fact-finding cases for people who have filed an initial claim but have not received any benefits. We are also continuing to uh, focus on fraud detection and prevention as well as recovery. And unfortunately, we continue to see fraudulent claims being filed every week. Um, so, Kim, do you want to walk us through this? this is a, an example of where the, the folks are? Sure. So, as you can see, uh, the, the dark blue that makes up the bottom of the graph in each of those columns are the individuals who have been paid. We have been steadily increasing since the end of June. Uh, the next group up are, as the commissioner said, we have a group of people that have applied for benefits but have not filed any weekly certifications. That's about 7%. Moving up into the, the light orange color, we have uh, 3,800 people who have been determined to be ineligible for benefits. Uh, and a lot of those folks uh, we know have, have filed their weekly certifications but have had excess earnings. Moving up into the next group, there are roughly 400 people remaining that are flagged as potentially fraudulent. And then at the top category in the light blue, 2,900 people that are in process. If we move to the next slide, um, there's a breakdown in the pie chart on the right-hand side of where those 2,900 people fall. Again, the bulk of them, just under 2,000, are awaiting fact-finding. As the commissioner said, and as we reported in previous weeks, we have a dedicated team 
that is working to going through those cases from oldest to newest. The, the next, the light blue, the 708 people that are, have been reviewed for unemployment, that means they're, we've determined that they're ineligible for regular state unemployment and they are waiting to roll over, if you will, into the PUA. This means that um, they need, there are questions that will be presented to them on their weekly certifications, questions that they need to answer so that we can determine their PUA eligibility. And the last two categories, we have 109 people listed as awaiting the B1. That's what we call our, our separation form. That's part of our normal processing. When somebody applies, submits an initial claim, we send out information to their previous employer to determine what happened to cause the separation. And then there, we have 119 people that are in pending status. This also is a result of uh, the initial claim filing. This could be we have a mismatch between um, us, our system and the Social Security Administration, either on their social or there's a name mismatch, or um, the individual reported that they worked for someone and we don't have any records of those, or vice versa, um, they said they didn't work for an employer that we have listed. So those are all issues that we have to work through before we can put someone into um, payment status. I'm going to dig into a little bit more on um, the claimants who fall into the fact-finding category. Uh, as you can see, we have, um, as the Deputy Commissioner said, been prioritizing from the oldest cases to the most recent cases. And so for March, there is still one case. For April, there is one case. In May, there are 30 cases. Um, June, we have 451. July is the bulk of the cases with 1,223, and then August, 290. As we said before, we're expediting these claims, and even though we have one in March and one in April, uh, one of the challenges is that if someone opened a claim in March, but then maybe there was a PPP loan or something that um, the person went back to work, they, their claim was open, but they were not actually filing weekly certifications or eligible for unemployment, and then let's say in June, they were either separated from their job or laid off, their claim would still trigger that March date. Right. So we do not anticipate um, getting down to zero in these categories, although we, we work very hard to get to zeros in March and, and April, but you may see over the weeks a slight increase in those earlier months uh, because of the situation that I just described. I don't know if there's anything else. Last week we did a pretty in-depth uh, conversation about fact-finding, so I think we were planning to move into some of the other issues that you've asked questions about for this week, but we'd be happy when we open it up for questions and answers to, to dig into any of the things that we've gone over uh, in greater depth. We thought it would be good to revisit the work search requirements and let you know what's happening with work search. We've been talking about this for several weeks now. Starting with the weekly certification for the week of August 9th, so that's the week that we're in, people should be looking, uh, engaged in work search activities. The first opportunity that anyone will have to answer work search questions will be on the weekly certification beginning on Sunday at basically 12.01, Sunday morning, will be the first time that those work search questions will be available to people on their weekly certification. One of the ways that we, uh, have tried to address some of the concerns that have been raised as well as a recognition that the pandemic is causing different, different challenges for people is that we have expanded what constitutes work search activities. So there are no blanket exceptions from the requirement to engage in work search activities. However, there are a broad range of um, things that people can be doing that will count as work search activities. Next slide, please. 
So we reviewed this a little bit last week and we'll go into a greater depth today. Things like attending a job fair, including virtual job fairs, will count. Participating in career center reemployment services virtually will count. Participating in virtual workshops will count. These are all in addition to the tr more traditional work search activities that people are more familiar with. There are also training opportunities defined very broadly that will be uh, considered as satisfying work search requirements, including participating in uh, any sort of job-related education or skills development programs or networking events. And those you can do uh, online as well as in person. One of the requirements that had been suspended during the, um, the, the early, from actually from March 15th until now, has been the requirement to have a profile on main job link. We are now um, putting that back in place so people will need to fill out a profile for the main job link, and that will be pretty much your entree into registering for any of these workshops. So just wanted to briefly go through the, the work search screens with you. We went through these last week in uh, detail. Everyone who's filing a weekly certification starting on Sunday will receive these first two questions, and it's whether or not you were self-employed and do you plan to return to self-employment or are you in contact with your previous employer about returning to work? And you should answer yes or no to those questions depending on, on your situation. If, you, if one of those situations does apply to you, if you are self-employed or you were expecting to go back to your previous employer, you would not be asked any of the additional work search questions. If you are not, if you are permanently separated from your previous employer, then you would get the questions on this screen, which is in essence asking during the during the week that you're filing for, did you participate in any of the activities? And then we'll ask you to identify which activities you participated in. If you did not, there's a box there where we're asking for an explanation on why you didn't participate in those activities. After hitting next here, um, you would be presented with the traditional weekly certification questions, such, such as were you able to work, were you available to work if it was offered to you, those, those general questions. And we mentioned this uh, last week as well, but one of the things that we are trying to do as we look at a broad range of work search activities is make sure that people have an opportunity to participate in skill enhancement. And we have partnered with Coursera. This is an online platform that uh, has agreed to provide 5,000 unemployed workers with free access to 3,800 courses. This is part of their workforce recovery initiative. They've been partnering with government agencies across the globe to help increase the skills for unemployed workers and help folks become uh, re-employed more quickly. And we did a quick cross match between some of the courses that are offered on, through the Coursera program and jobs that are currently listed on the main job bank. We have about 1,200 jobs listed there. 12,000. I mean, 12,000, yes, thank you. Um, and of those uh, jobs, about 421 identified some of these courses um, as related to the skills that they were looking for. We just made this available earlier this week, and since yesterday, we've already had uh, almost 100 people inquire, and 28 people have already registered for classes. Uh, mostly, they're, at least from what I've been able to see, they're very interested in some of the IT skills, as, and um, it seems to be uh, off to a good start. If people are interested, they must register by September 30th, and they must complete the program by the end of the year. So this is very specifically targeted to people during this time frame where we have identified a, uh, the pandemic. 
uh, as having an impact on people's ability to look for work and um, and we're hoping that at least 5,000 mean people will take advantage of this this opportunity. Again, this just tells you how to sign up and the job link again is that entryway into this program. We will be sending information out using the information that is supplied in the main job link in order to connect with potential um, learners and to use that as kind of the communication uh, uh, channel for any updates or answering um, additional information. And the career centers are the hub for providing this information. We have folks at each of the career centers who are familiar with the program and able to provide additional information to anyone who is interested. But again, this is for people who are unemployed and are connected through the mean job link. And I just wanted to add that anyone who's participating in those courses, their, their weekly work on that course would count as their work search activity. Exactly. So the other question that we're receiving is about work share. Um, again, a few weeks ago, we had some conversations about it, but we wanted to dig into it a little bit deeper today to answer some questions that have been raised. First of all, what is it? It, is, it was designed as a layoff aversion program, but it is, we work in partnership with the U.S. Department of Labor. It is not a requirement for every state to have a work share program. Some states call it a, a temporary uh, short-term compensation program. In Maine, we call it a work share program. About 23 states offer this as an option to employers in their states. It is run through the Bureau of Unemployment Compensation. The goal is to help businesses keep their workers during a temporary slowdown. It allows the employers to reduce the hours of staff in a consistent way uh, instead of laying people off. And I think that that consistent way has been one of the challenges. Typically, the, the program was designed to help manufacturers so that if they knew there was going to be a slowdown during a, a, a short time of the year, that they, instead of laying people off, could perhaps reduce everyone in the unit by about 20% uh, and then keep people on so that you didn't lose skilled workers. And then also, they'd get their regular salary plus a, a percentage of unemployment benefits as well. And that was really the intent. It was during primarily manufacturing, it was primarily during short-term slowdowns. What's been happening during this pandemic is it's being also used to not just uh, keep people connected to the workforce, but also as businesses are trying to bring people back on board. And it is being used by an array of uh, business sectors that were never envisioned in the original design of this program. I, I think before the pandemic, we had somewhere between one in three employers using it, and now hundreds of employers are using this program. I believe we have about 3,000 employees who are currently participating in WorkShare. So it has grown exponentially since March. Kim, do you wanna walk through um, the responsibilities. Sure. So in order for a business to be eligible for the work share program, as, as the commissioner said, the, the, down, the downturn in hours must be temporary, not related to a seasonal downturn. Uh, employees' hours within the unit can be reduced anywhere from 10%, but not more than 50%. And it has to avoid a layoff of at least 10% of the workers in that affected unit. Um, the, the unit is one that has to normally operate on a full-time basis. That doesn't mean that everybody in the unit has to be working full-time, but it has to be a full-time operation. Um, and there is a minimum, you have to have two or more employees in a, in a unit. And as the commissioner said, um, you know, employers must have an approved plan, but modifications can be made to the plan, but they have to be submitted to the department in advance and approved by, by us. 
um, and the, both plans are not intended to vary frequently. And I think that as we're seeing more and more businesses using it, I think that it's that part of it that has been most challenging, that if a business frequently has to adjust their hours for their employees or move people from one unit to another unit, though this program was not designed to um, be nimble in that way and to make those kind of accommodations. And although this is not a program that is required, excuse me, to be provided by departments of labor, it is a federal state partnership. So it is, uh, we must stay in compliance with the federal guidelines as, um, as we implement uh, this program in the state. So uh, there, there were um, certain designs put in place that uh, we are seeing may need to be changed and we would be advocating for those changes with our federal partners. I think we felt like a layoff aversion program would be very similar to the situations that businesses were facing and reopening, but it didn't quite play out that way. So there has been a lot of variation amongst the employers and even within an employer's plan, there's been a lot of variation. So on the, Kim walked through the employer side. On the employee side, uh, they, some of the requirements there is they must be in the affected unit. So as we said, you could have you know, an accounting group over here and you may have a um, manufacturing group as well. And if you're in the accounting group, it, you and that's part of work share, then that's great. But if you're in the manufacturing part of the house and that was not included in the plan, you can't go back and forth and it's not an employee's decision. It's up to the employer to lay those um, uh, constraints out and convey those to the employees. In addition, each individual employee, in order to be eligible to participate, must meet the monetary requirements, the monetary eligibility requirements for state unemployment benefits. So Kim and I could work in the same unit, but uh, I just started working here and I, um, oh, I should flip it the other way around. I was going to say, and I just graduated from <laughs> school. Um, well, yeah, I didn't that's a stretch of the imagination, but I, I've recently entered the workforce for whatever reason. And I do not have the earning history behind me, so I may not be eligible even if we're in the same unit. Right. And uh, anyone who is participating must still be able and available to work their normally scheduled hours if their employer had asked them to do that. And then the benefits are if you're, um, uh, if you've had your hours reduced by 25%, you would receive 25% of your normal unemployment benefit. And again, that's based on your own individual um, weekly benefit amount. And you could have two coworkers who would have different uh, uh, weekly benefit amounts, even working for the same employer. And so the weekly process for filing a work share claim is each individual logs into their re-employee account and, and fills out their weekly certification, but also each employer needs to send us on a weekly basis a spreadsheet that outlines uh, the individuals and the hours they worked. So it is um, a two-step process for filing the weekly certifications for work share. And in the work share unit, uh, we have been supplementing the group of people working on it by adding some of our career center staff. And the best way to have issues resolved are by going through the HR department at the particular company, because that's the person who regularly stays in contact with our staff here to make any adjustments. Um, I think that's it for mm -hmm. the slides. Are there questions? So a constituent has been receiving UI. It stopped about six weeks ago uh, when we asked for ID, which was sent in. Uh, but the notice on her UI site still says an active claim does not exist. So 
for the entered Social Security number in submitting questions to us. What does that mean? I think that is something that we will have to um, look into specifically. So if you could send us that, send the name to Isaac, that would be great. Commissioner, this is Representative Scott Cuddy. Do you mind if I pose a question? Not at all. Um, so on the very first slide, because I've been confused by the president's executive order, kind of from the get-go, um, when you were discussing the executive order, you made mention of some funds that Maine was already paying out that could be used as matching funds. Could you explain that again? Because I it it didn't jive with my understanding of how things were going to go. Well, it's an, it's an ever-evolving uh, target, uh, Representative. So. Uh, that is, um, that's understandable. Based on the information that we have as of, you know, 135 on Friday afternoon, we will be able to use the money that is currently being spent on state unemployment insurance as a match for the $300 portion of the, um, uh, of the lost wage assistance program. Does that make sense? I think so. so. I so add, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Kim. I'm sorry. As if I could add to that. So we have heard from USDOL that the match has to be made on the aggregate level. So we have estimated that the the weekly the state's weekly share, if we were to pay the three hundred dollars, would be roughly $8 million a week. If we're spending at least $8 million in benefits out of the state unemployment trust fund, they will consider that as match. If okay. we were to pay the $400, we have to come up with a new pot of $8 million in essence. Right, that we could only use the state unemployment to match that first piece for the 300, but they have clearly told us that we cannot use any of the unemployment insurance um, administrative money or any other money that we have received for unemployment insurance toward the match for the $400. Okay, so I think I fundamentally misunderstood the program from the beginning. My understanding, and I'm just gonna put this out there in case anybody else understood it the same way, was that you would have, um, uh, an employee or a, somebody who's unemployed who's receiving $300 as their weekly benefit from the state. Previously, they would then receive another $600 that was federal money. That money is now ended, so now they're only getting their $300. From the if state, the yeah. Right. If the president's order were to go into effect, Maine would have to come up with another $100, and then there would be $300 provided by the federal government so that the individual receiving it would see a $300 check from the state of Maine and then a $400, another $400 and for a total of 700 pre-tax dollars. How that money would get paid out was the federal government would provide another 300 and the state would provide an additional 100. That was where that other 400 would come from. The matching of that is confusing to me. When you say that we can count, if somebody isn't, so I guess if somebody isn't receiving $300 already, we wouldn't be matching the 300 for that. Yeah, individual. you only have to match 25%. And this is why it's, this is, thank you for raising this question. These are all questions we've been asking ourselves, asking USDOL, asking FEMA, asking other states, everyone is struggling to try to understand how would this really work. Our best understanding <clears throat> is that, as Kim said, as long as in the aggregate, we are paying out at least $8 million in state unemployment assistance, in state mm -hmm. benefits, we would be able to draw down the $300 benefit. So if someone was receiving $300, they would also get an additional $300 for the federal benefit on top of it. What gets 
there are a lot of things that get tricky. But one of the things that gets tricky is it's not that they need to get $300 representative, but you must um, receive at least $100 in an unemployment benefit in order to be eligible for any of this. So right now we have at least 1,200 people in Maine who are receiving less than $100 in state unemployment insurance. So those folks would not be eligible. <clears throat> Additionally, we do not know if the $100 is in their weekly benefit amount before any, um, you know, perhaps they have a child support obligation or something else that's deducted from their benefit. Does it, does, do we have to wait until those deductions are made to determine if that person is receiving $100 or is it just if they're eligible for $100, does that count? Um, and, and we don't know the answers to that yet. Additionally, there's, with unemployment insurance, there's a guarantee. So when the CARES Act came in, the guarantee was that if you were eligible and you applied, you met those eligibility requirements between certain dates that the programs were running, you would be able to receive those benefits. This pot of money is not unemployment insurance, it's disaster relief money. So it is coming out of a pot of money dedicated toward disasters. $44 billion have been moved out and set aside for this purpose, supposedly between August 1st and December 27th. Yet they have said that if that pot of money falls to, um, uh, below $25 billion, or, you know, because of federal disaster, the program ends. So it's unclear if this money will be there during that time frame. Um, and there are just lots and lots of questions that, that need to be answered. And I would just add to that, if it's if it's the disaster recovery, disaster relief fund drops to $25 billion for any reason. It could be the payout of these lost wage assistance payments, or it could be payouts because of uh, hurricane relief. Right. So once that pot hits $25 billion, this program is no longer available. Okay. Um, and it's unclear how, how, how all of those pieces work. Also, USDOL has said that no administrative funds or program can, monies can be used to implement this new disaster relief program. So we need a lot of clarity to determine. It says no staff, no IT, no buildings, um, without a cost sharing agreement in place. So there, there are just lots of, lots of questions about how we would do it. Uh, the application process, there's an application process, um, and states have been given until September 10th to apply um, for this program. And we are doing our best to understand as much as possible um, about this because we, we believe people need, need benefits and we, we're trying to figure out, you know, can this program work? If so, what would it look like and how would we implement it? Um, thank you. And I, I mean, I can just see, you know, I've worked with so many people who've had trouble with unemployment and if, if they are told that this benefit will exist from this point in time to this point in time, and suddenly that number falls below 25 billion and that ends prematurely, and people have already planned on receiving that benefit for another week or two, that's gonna be very difficult. Um, I have a second question that's unrelated, so I'm gonna step back and if somebody else has a question, I'll let them go, and if nobody does, then I would like to have uh, one more question. Sounds like the floor is yours. <laughs> Hearing none. So there's, um, uh, Kim, you were talking about a new screen that will be appearing next week, and there are going to be two questions on that screen. If, yeah. it is, if it is possible, can we reshare that screen to go back to that? Um, I don't know if, if Isaac is there and can do that or not, but the... Yeah, just pulling it up. It's also, we do have it on our website. The two screenshots are available. Uh, okay, on the great. Um, my concern with it is, the two screen or the, the two questions both 
seem to indicate that I, I'm going to have to answer both of these. And you do have to answer both, yeah. You do have to answer both. So if I say, yes, I was self-employed, if I was a self-employed person, um, I was self-employed and I do plan on returning to self-employment, yes. <laughs> then I don't, I don't have an answer for question two because I am, I am not in contact with my previous employer. I'm self-employed. <laughs> um, so then you would say no. And that's one of those instances where in terms of the plain language of the question that it might be very helpful to have a parentheses, you know, if you are self-employed answer no to this question um, or, or something along those lines. It, I have found in my own filing for unemployment that there are times when the language is, I can dope it out and figure out why, but it's a, it is actually a fairly plain statement that I am self-employed. I do plan on it. Yes. And once I've answered yes, I've, I've moved past the, the requirement, but the second question no longer really applies to me. And if we, if we can't do an, if then set up where the second question just doesn't appear, if you answer yes, if there's some kind of explanation we could put at the second question, it seems like it would be helpful. Y'all have already thought about all that, but this is something that as I was looking at this screen, it did occur to me and I wanted to bring it up. So thank you very much. No, thank you. Yeah, and the intent is, is as I'm sure you understand, was the two groups of people who are not going to get that whole list of questions would fall into one of these categories. Um, and so I, but I hear what you're saying and that's good feedback. So uh, this is Shanna, and I have a couple of questions, um, Commissioner, uh, if you have a moment. It's not about um, the new benefit. It's going back to those initial slides of, it was very helpful to see cases resolved and to see that 98% of the cases have been resolved. Um, but then obviously all of us on this call are mindful of the 3,900 people that are not yet resolved because many of us hear mm -hmm. from them um weekly or, or daily even is there a way for um legislators is it possible for isaac um to convey to us where some of our people may in fact fall because i think there is some miscommunication out there or some confusion people don't know are they waiting for fact finding are they actually not eligible and no one has told them or perhaps it's been communicated, but they haven't understood or haven't received a communication. So I'm not sure if that's feasible, but if it were to help us understand um, where in the problem set our constituents fall, um, because I know for many of us, I mean, I still have cases that are dating back into May and the first weekend June, um, and the desperation levels for some of them are, are just increasing. No, Senator, I agree. I mean, that's one of the things we're working toward is to how is how to um, come up with a mechanism so that we can sort people and provide that information. So it's a it's a it's a question that we're trying to come up with an answer for, and it's on our list. So okay, um, a follow up to that question is it seems that there may have been either something with the computer or maybe some challenges that are ongoing with the Postal Service, um, but there's some people who either believe that they have appealed or tried to appeal online and even one constituent had a screenshot of that but never received anything um, from the department with regards to the appeal or didn't receive um, were information on how to appeal in the mail. So if someone has weeks, you know, somewhere back in their history that they weren't receiving, um, is it possible for them to file an appeal at this time? Um, despite those, I understand the deadlines are pretty strict um, in terms of the appeals process. I think that's the kind of thing that we would look at on a case by case basis, Senator. So um, I would just say to have the individual file the appeal and 
and explain why why it was not filed within the 15 days and then let the process go through the process to determine whether that was a, a good cause and then um, let the process go forward. Okay, and that's very helpful. So one of the so, things I'm not sure about the system, they should be able to still file the appeal using the re-employ me system, Kim? Uh, I'm not sure if they no, can. No, Senator, they would have they'd to, have to do it in writing. Use one of the other options yes. to file the appeal. Yes. Okay. Um, that the makes other sense. thing I would just add in general, whenever we issue a, a decision that has appeal rights, uh, that appeal, an electronic version of that letter is always available in the re-employ me account, even if it doesn't get through the mail. Uh, we send it both ways, electronically and uh, via postal mail. And I think sometimes... I'm trying to look for the electronic notification. Yeah, under the correspondence yeah. would... And I think sometimes there there. are if people are not familiar with the process, they may not realize that they have that ability to go into that correspondence file and access that. But anything that we send by mail is also included electronically there as well. Yeah. Um, so I have two more questions, and, and forgive yeah. me. Um, if there's somebody else that, on this call that wants to ask a question first, I, I don't want to um, monopolize time. Okay. Um, so, uh, a, a constituent who seems to be stuck awaiting PUA determination, um, but when they look at the criteria for earnings with their W-2, they in fact appear to be eligible for regular unemployment, but somehow the system is not picking up their W-2 earnings. Um, what should they do beyond calling their senator? Um, I'm speaking about a specific case where their HR office who's actually in state government instructed them to contact us um, at this point months ago. And their account shows them as PUA eligible, but they are not, it's not transferring. And they're, and yeah, so questions about people, I guess, who are eligible for regular unemployment and get transferred over to PUA. Is that, do you know anything about that or have you heard of that before? No, yeah. <laughs> that's not something that I, we're aware of as any sort of a system issue, Senator. I, I think okay. the only, I mean, if the person was saying they received wages, usually it works, is they report that they received wages somewhere and um, the employer doesn't have wages and that could trigger a, a fact finding or investigation. Um, but someone who the employer is saying they have wages and they say they have wages it is not a case that uh, has come up that I'm aware of. And as far as reaching out to us, certainly please call the 800 number. I know it's difficult to get through, especially earlier in the week. We are finding people have much better success in the afternoons or later in the week. Okay. Um, and then the, the last question I have is from a constituent. This is another one that's been stuck for, for some time. They received the PUA determination because of the automated match with the IRS, which was great. It bumped their benefits level, which changed their eligibility for some of their past weeks. But their weeks were frozen when the fraud happened. And then today their account clicked over to say that they were eligible for $0. Um, is that a good thing, a bad thing? Um, this is someone who's who's been on the phones with people. She calls every week. Um, tier two people can't seem to help, and um, then she got this message this morning and just felt, you know, she'd been excited by the PUA determination letter and nothing happened. Um, do you have? Do you know when it flips over to say you're eligible for zero? What does that mean in general? I think it means it's something that we have to look at. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. Okay. Are there other other questions? If not, I, I think the issues that we'll be paying attention to will be um, over the next week or so, the executive order, um, 
We're also paying close attention to what is happening with work search requirements. Um, and, uh, you know, please, as always, feel free to send questions ahead of time because we do try to tailor uh, our Friday briefings on the issues that you've raised to make sure that we answer any questions that you do have that are, you know, kind of system-wide. And individual constituent issues, please continue to get those uh, to Isaac. So thank you all, and I hope you have a uh, wonderful rest of your afternoon. Thank you.